Greetings. Uh, my name is Kathy Wood. I'm CIO and CEO of ARK Invest. Uh, I hope you're all healthy, uh, staying out of harm's way these days. Uh, and we do thank you for spending time with us today. Uh, we're going to be sharing with you on our Biz 2020 Volume 3 question and answer video conference, uh, some trusted sources about uh, educating us about disruptive innovation. Uh, as we are communicating daily through our research, disruptive innovation is evolving more quickly than even we imagined when we started ARC in uh, 2014. And as a result, we want to keep up with it and keep in touch with our trusted sources. Uh, so today, we have two trusted sources uh, who are going to help us see how quickly the world is changing in terms of gaming and drones. Uh, for, for gaming, we're joined by Ryan Wyatt, who uh, is head of uh, gaming at, at YouTube. Uh, and we also have uh, Adam Bree, who is CEO and co-founder of Skydio, on the drone front. So uh, I would like to start uh, this off with our Q&A for uh, Ryan. And who better could we have uh, for uh, this interview than Ryan, who has grown uh, the YouTube gaming community from zero uh, six years ago to more than 200 million people. So with that, uh, let's get on with the show. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. We are so lucky to be here with Ryan Wyatt, who is the head of gaming at YouTube. Uh, now, Ryan uh, joined YouTube when he was 27 years old, six years ago. Now, uh, in the green room, we were talking about this. ARC started in 2014 as well. And most of our analysts were in their mid-20s. So lots of... Uh, uh, DNA in common there, Ryan. Really happy to have you join us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It sounds like I'm in good company. Yes. Well, uh, you have done an unbelievable job at uh, uh, at YouTube. Uh, we know that you have more than 200 million daily average users, uh, which is phenomenal. That's from zero in the day, right? So. Quite, quite a success story. And I know that uh, you uh, look maniacally at live gaming watch time. Uh, so, so we'd love to just get a little bit of a, an update on that metric since, uh, since uh, it's so important to you. And also maybe to uh, like to get to know a little bit about what got you to this place uh, of success, both before and after YouTube. Yeah, looking forward to, to talking about it. Where do you where do you want me to jump in first? Well, why don't we talk about uh, just the significance of gaming uh, in the overall entertainment industry today? Uh, you know, I think it's a lot more significant than most investors certainly understand. So maybe you could put that into perspective. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I actually wholeheartedly agree. I mean, there's still some stigmas and cliches that exist around the industry, but I, I I do think of this idea that gaming is some kind of like niche insider business is, is an outdated take at this point. I mean, if you if you look at like ESA's number, Entertainment Software Association, uh, there's two billion gamers worldwide. We have over 160 million people playing video games in the United States. Um, it's almost a $150 billion business right across this. Now there's a lot of different facets to that number that I think you know we'll be able to dive in and talk deeper about, but the industry is sizable. It's only continuing to grow. There's only more money and investments in general going into the industry overall. Um, I think the best way that I've ever been able to kind of describe the size to people that work in traditional entertainment that don't have kind of these insights. Um, there was a really interesting data release in 2018 that both YouTube Gaming did, which is how much people are watching gaming watch time on YouTube, and Reed did with Netflix. So we finally had this like really fun comparison and you can poke holes in this, but it's, it's, a, it's the best kind of like apples to apples comparison that I can kind of bring up in these discussions. Netflix did uh, 51 billion hours of watch time on their platform in 2018. This is something that they publicly stated as an end of year release uh, in 2018. 
Gaming did over 50 billion hours of watch time in 2018 as well. So if you just look at this 2018 stat, and obviously we have, we'll see what the stats are in the future, but uh, you know, both companies continue to grow astronomically. But in 2018, the amount of watch time that was happening on gaming video on YouTube was the same amount of watch time that happened in the entirety of Netflix. So this is a great you know, spec to just see like, where is this space going? How big is this industry? And this is just talking about people that watch people play video games. So like when you get an idea of just that business, then you're like, wow, the playing base, the revenue base is sizable. And so I think it's a, it, there's not a better time to be talking about gaming in the direction that it's going. Yeah, well, one of the things is we've studied the gaming industry uh, that, uh, again, as an investor, startled me and uh, uh, drummed up my interest dramatically. We did a study last year, and if you look at uh, television and music and gaming, you compare them as new technologies evolve. Uh, what happened to television and music is you saw tremendous disruption and a shrinkage of the industry in terms of the dollars. But with each new technology in gaming, the industry has expanded. And uh, that is very interesting to me as an investor. You know, uh, we, we've stayed away from music and TV, uh, but that gaming actually should, should become much more dynamic as these new technologies evolve. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree. I think there's this really interesting symbiotic relationship between making games, hardware for games, watching people play video games, whether it's esports, live streaming, edited upload gaming video, that this is kind of like an ecosystem where all ships continue to rise to your point. Like you haven't seen, you know, people watching gaming video cannibalize people playing, right? That's actually lifted it up and has been causal to drive more people to spend on games, play more games, right? And so um, to your point, if I had to go back, you know, five, six years ago and answer this question, I thought there could have been a disruption in a way that maybe did cannibalize this business, but the, it, it has been the complete opposite. We're like all ships continue to rise on the development of new platforms, new hardware. Even when we look at competition in the space with gaming video, it's like Amazon's entry to the space, Facebook's entry to the space, Google's to the space, Tencent, right? Like this has been very beneficial for everybody, truth be told. And so um, I do too agree with you that it, it is one of the fascinating things that makes the games industry pretty unique. And, and I think uh, the industry is changing very rapidly. Yes. You know, even in the last year, so many changes. Could you talk about how it's changed in the last year and how you see it changing going forward? Yeah, there's a couple of trends and, and I'll try not to be too verbose with my answer here, but I think they're very interesting and we can kind of figure out which one we wanna dive in deeper. So a couple of things that I've been noticing in the in very particularly in the past year, is the rise of mobile gaming and content consumption, right? So mobile gaming has always been a really big revenue driver to that overall total games revenue number that I shared with you. But what we're starting to see are a lot more people watch people play mobile games as well. This is because hardware is no longer, hardware is getting better in phones and games that are being developed are not um, inherently casual anymore. So instead of just like Candy Crush being the game that you think of with mobile games, you're starting to see these shooter battle royale games that people are playing. And so Southeast Asia, uh, India, Latin America, and some of these places where console PC penetration isn't tremendously high, you're seeing the primary device for gaming happening on mobile devices. And so this is creating this huge appetite of kind of a new wave of gamers that are coming into the fold. And now they're watching and consuming content on the platform around mobile games. That's like one pillar in the last 12 months that have been meaningful. You're also, on the other hand, starting to see the start of cloud gaming. Now, cloud gaming is a long-term bet. And, you know, Kathy, I'm sure you'll want to talk about that in more detail later. So I'll kind of leave it at that. But there, that is like, you're basically starting to see the, um, the foundation of the house of cloud gaming start to get built in a meaningful way now. Um, it's definitely a long-term bet. You know, you, you need a lot of things to happen from broadband capping and 5G and internet accessibility. But it opens up a whole new world of game development it blurs the lines between watching and playing games in a newfound way. And so these are two very particular things that have happened in the last 12 months um, that it, it should be on everybody's radar. And 
And I know that the the culture of gaming has changed in recent years. It, you know, different demographics. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well, and maybe where you see that going. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is you're seeing um, now that millennials have really aged up and they've aged up with the gaming generation, you're seeing the average age start to skew older within gaming. And the other thing that you're seeing is, and you're looking in like the, the young 30s, right? This millennial audience that continues to play video games, you're seeing the diversity of games be more inclusive to a broader spectrum of individuals, both age range and gender. And so you're seeing a lot more female um Female gamers come online as well and start to have more appeal, both on the playing side and content creation side. So I think as I think what's happening in general is this, you know, we go back to kind of talking about the stigmas in the beginning, like this idea that it's just, you know, a 15, 15 year old boys playing in their mom's basement is long gone now. And you're seeing kind of gaming be much more inclusive to a, a variety of individuals as the game development you, you now can see games where you identify and have interest in, right? And so this is opening up gaming to a much, much broader audience. And it's been really exciting to see. And, and we see it in the numbers. And like I said, just seeing um, the growth in our overall user base get bigger as some of these other regions come online in a meaningful way with gaming. But again, the game development is really opening up the funnel for people to age up with gaming and also um, be more inclusive to... Uh, female gamers and not just male gamers. Okay. Uh, so now that we've sort of set the stage, the backdrop, uh, how far do you think we are away from cloud streaming going mainstream? Is this going to be 10 years, five years? And the reason I ask the question that way is anything cloud related where you've got a lot of big players going for it at the same time, yep. it tends to happen very quickly, much more quickly. Than, than people anticipate. Are there real technological roadblocks, do you think, in the way? Or uh, just a, a bit more about that? Yeah, so I think cloud gaming, um, you know, it's one of those things, like you just gotta put, uh, you know, one foot in front of the other. I think it's great that the whole industry is moving in that direction because I don't see it, you know, look, I think it's gonna take five years for cloud gaming to be a material player in the games ecosystem, right? I mean, you have hardware that's easily accessible, whether it's new consoles, PCs, um, you have mobile gaming that's incredibly accessible to everybody, right? The Nintendo Switch that's very accessible. So I don't look at as, as, at this thing that says we're going to move into a world where people are just cloud gaming. And I think that's not the, the the approach or the perspective that I personally have. What I think of it as is, is another very complementary way to play video games. And the development of what you can do when the games are in the cloud, it really opens up games like from a development standpoint that are impossible to make in a world that's hardware and i think when you fixate on like what's exciting about cloud that's got to be the thing that people are that, that people should talk about and get excited about because when all of that stuff is being computed in the cloud it is going to materially change the way people think about how and what they can develop from games to give you an example you don't have like battle royale games are you know 100 people you do a battle royale game with a thousand people in because of cloud technology you could yes so what does that do for a game developer when they have that tools in their toolkit right what does it do like say you're watching me stream my video games live right and all of a sudden you say you know just making this up but it's like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna give ryan five dollars and i'm gonna drop him a weapon into the game and boom there and immediately you can do it while playing right and so that's when i say it blurs those lines between watching and playing it is going to have a level of interactivity with people creating content and people watching and playing that loop. It's going to have a level of interactivity that is um, not fathomable on anything that's hardware related. So I look at it as it's not this thing that's going to just eat hardware alive. It's going to be another thing that you can utilize and leverage to play games. And I think that's the positioning that you know a lot of individuals are looking at, whether it's Luna or xCloud or Stadia and so forth. But I think it's great... Um, that you got to start somewhere, right? And so, yeah, it's incredibly ambitious. It, it's not going to hit the ground running right now. There is 5G challenges, internet connectivity challenges, data availability in a lot of the countries, right? So like cloud gaming isn't going to be this overnight thing. And, and in fact, it, it will probably take five years to really establish a foothold in the market. Um, but I, I'm bullish on it long-term just because I think of it, it, it just, it opens up so many doors on the creative side that it's going to be hard to ignore once people get their hands around that technology, 
make games very specifically for it, which is not what you're seeing right now. You're basically seeing parody launches of hardware games on cloud gaming. And I don't think that's the exciting part. It's long term what game developers will be able to do with the tech. So this is another example of a new technology or breakthrough that is going to increase the market market size, not cannibalize anything. So Correct. It's just another step along the way, which is, and it could be the most important step because as, as you say, of the scaling uh, 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 that it will enable, right? You're seeing some like really interesting paths long-term converge as well, because it goes back to that. It's like hardware and phones are getting better, right? So like displays, devices, they're getting cheaper, right? That That's all, that's a path that's happening over the next five years will continue to happen. You're seeing 5G accessibility start to happen. And so you'll have a phone that you might tap into a cloud game or you might sideload like games right off the hardware of it, right? And I think it will be optionality of it. And that to your point, it's going to be incremental. I think this idea that cloud gaming is going to be this substantial thing that cannibalizes console or hardware is is not the right take. Um, it wasn't the right take when people had the PC console argument. It hasn't happened with mobile gaming devices have become more you know prominent people playing gaming, right? So I agree that it is another thing where all ships rise in this in this in this stage, right? Because I look at cloud gaming will be really helpful to YouTube gaming's growth. Um, but mobile gaming and hardware and all the consoles and PC gaming will continue as well because you're always going to have gamers that are going to want to be on the forefront of mm -hmm. hardware and you're always going to have gamers that are going to want ease and accessibility and you're always going to want gamers that are going to want to try new games and some of that might happen in cloud, right? So, you know, it's I, I think I think it's really exciting and it's going to keep moving that industry forward. It's going to make it bigger. Um, it's going to make gaming more inclusive to more people. And it's probably going to change faster. Uh, and, and it's yes. already been changing pretty quickly. So I think uh, many investors uh, are shocked to learn that uh, the sale of virtual goods has generated revenue of about $130 billion around the world today. I mean, some people don't even understand what that is, you know? Yeah. And I'm talking about investors who probably have dismissed gaming as, as a niche area that's going to be cannibalized and so forth. But uh, 130 billion, and we think it is going to more than double over five years. So it'll grow faster than 20% at a compound annual rate. But what you just said about cloud suggests to me that might be uh, too, too low of an estimate. Yeah, time will tell. I definitely agree with you as far as the accelerated growth rate and overall as you're starting to add some of these things on. In the um I chuckled at the 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 digital goods thing because I have spent so much money on games coined free to play solely on cosmetic items or maybe a better weapon or a better item, right? And so I actually believe long term the games that are going to be the best for YouTube, the best for revenue generating are kind of these, um, I, I call them like games as a service, if you will, right? So think of like Minecraft, Fortnite, Roblox, right? Even games like Grand Theft Auto that had these like really tremendous narratives, but they have this open world where you play, iterate, downloadable content that you pay for to keep it fresh. These are the games that really are going, have already changed this industry and are gonna continue to gen, uh, change the industry. That's not to say these AAA titles aren't great too. Call of Duty was released today. I'm sure they're going to do phenomenal, right? Like a lot of people are really excited for it. But I look at a game like Minecraft. Minecraft came out in 2009. It was an indie game, right? And you have that whole narrative, you have that whole storyline where, you know, Microsoft acquires it and it's become this like multi billion dollar property. It has its entire time been the number one game on YouTube. And at no point has it ever been dethroned, even in Fortnite's heyday, right? So this idea where you can have these open world games, you iterate on them, you allow people to buy digital goods, digital assets, new content, and you keep releasing that, you keep improving on it. There's a huge appetite for people uh, in that, in that um, game category, right? And you might have somebody that steps away for three years from that game and a new content pack comes out or something's released and it draws them back in. And so when I look at our top games on YouTube, you know, it's that, it's Minecraft, it's Fortnite, it's 
League of Legends and, and, you know, which is like its own kind of thing on the MOBA side, but it's some of these platforms that they're like, we're going to launch a game. We're going to keep iterating on it. We're going to keep selling you digital goods, selling you expansions, and you love the game so much, you're going to continue to invest in it instead of going and buying a, a wide variety of games. It's a little long-winded answer, but that's why I, I think you the conversation around, you know, iterating and updating content within games and digital goods within games is a really, really important conversation to be having. Right. And uh, again, it uh, diffuses another misperception, I think, it, that is out there in the investment community, which is, hey, this is just a hit driven model. You know, it's uh, and, and it's anything but, uh, especially given uh, the examples you just gave us. Yeah. And that's so, an old take as well. That's why I think it yeah. is good. We're having these conversations because this is these they need updated. Right. It, I think, Absolutely. you know, six years ago, you could definitely argue it's a hit driven business. It's like X publisher launches X AAA game and it's rinse and repeat, right? And that that model has changed drastically over the last five or six years. Absolutely. So uh, now, what about esports? Why why isn't it really taking off? It is in some way, of course. It's, yep. it's the largest. But uh, just to, what what is your take on esports and and you know what if anything is is holding it back from? you know, mass market adoption. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, when I was in college, I was an esports commentator. So I and played and played competitively. So like esports is very near and dear to my heart. Um, look, I think it is growing astronomically. Esports is, you know, 10% of watch time that's happening in the games industry overall, when you look at all the platforms, right? So it's and it's moving, right? And, and you see a lot of different games hitting new records of peak concurrency. I mean, I laughed the other day, I saw Garena Free Fire, which is a mobile game only, hit a million concurrent live stream viewers in Portuguese speaking only Brazil stream, right? Mobile wow. gaming esports. It's like, this is unheard of, right? You saw League of Legends just did Worlds and they hit record breaking numbers across the board. They released those. Um, the NFL has started 100 years ago, right? So, like, I think people have unrealistic expectations that esports should be in line immediately with traditional sports today. At the rate that Traditional sports is growing, and at the rate esports is growing, I think it's a, I think a very sane, pragmatic, reasonable person would argue fairly that esports will be in line with traditional sports viewership in ten years, no doubt. Um, I think a lot of what's happening is esports growth has really gotten there. Brands don't know if they're buying Major League Baseball or the Little League World Series, so there's a lot of brand education that needs to happen. Um, I think. We use esports as such a blanket term, but that's like talking about sports and not re recognizing the nuance between cricket and MLB and golf and NBA, right? And wrestling and boxing, right? So that's how you have to look at these games. These games have different backgrounds. They are different styles. They appeal to different people, right? They appeal to different people in different regions too, right? Where like you see MOBAs be really big in Southeast Asia and you see you know, competitive shooters or tactical shooters be really big in, in Europe and North America, right? Um, so I think I think a lot of it will be evangelizing and educating over the next couple of years so brands get comfortable and excited. That'll inject more capital in the space. I think a lot of these game publishers have done a fantastic job of bringing in traditional sports talent to work with the esports leagues, right? So if you look at um, Tony that just came over from MLB over to um, Activision Blizzard to kind of run their esports operations and um, one of their uh, their chief revenue officers backgrounds in the NBA. And so what you're starting to see is this really nice mix of deep endemic gaming knowledge mixed with traditional sports. And so I think it's inevitable, to be honest with you, especially when you look at the size of gamers and the interest in that content. Yeah, I think that's another hockey stick uh, in the future. I really yes. do. Yeah. Uh, now, what about the impact of uh, game engines like uh, Unity and Unreal Networks? How is that impacting your ecosystem? And actually, many investors don't even know what that is. This is uh, yep. a, a fairly recent uh, development. So maybe you could talk about the, first explain it, and then how you see it uh, helping to evolve your ecosystem. Yeah, so the best way I would describe game engines is like what... Um, Microsoft Word is to an author, what Excel is to a finance manager, what uh, Photoshop is to a photographer, right? It's their tool they use to develop the piece of work that they're going to produce, right? So these game engines allow 
particularly companies and individuals that don't have their own proprietary game engines, which some, some companies do, right? They make their own game engines. These are basically how you make a video game from scratch, the assets that live in it, how you build, how you develop them. Unity does a great job with VR, mobile games. Unreal, which is owned by Epic, really allows you to tap into, and, and Fortnite's a great example of how that engine's used, but people make a variety of games on it. And what it has effectively done is democratize the ability for anybody to make video games. If you wanna make a video game, there's zero excuse, right? You have the tools at your disposal, it's like downloading and paying for Photoshop, right? And that's kind of if you're a game developer. Um, so I think those are really important assets and you are seeing the bigger uh, industries develop game engines and those are gonna continue to you know, iterate and evolve, but they're very important pieces and tools um, in the developer's tool belt. So you think this is another accelerator then? Yeah, I think the beauty about these game engines is, um, is again, it, it's the ability to let anybody develop a video game. And that is, again, good for the space. Because what can happen is Minecraft started as an indie, right? Um, look at what happening is happening with Among Us, right? Indie game developed, right? Kind of sat nowhere for a couple of years and then blew up, right? Creator ecosystem, everybody's playing this game. And so there are great success stories that come out of the ability to democratize game development. And so I love, I love what these two companies are doing. And they're definitely companies to keep your eye on as they continue down that path. They do great things for this industry. Right. And and that will become even more important in terms of cloud cloud streaming, right? Yeah, I think like I, I don't I don't know necessarily that it's it's you know, they'll have to consider development on cloud technology long term and what those engines do or don't do and how they play a part in that, which they obviously will play a part in it. Um but I think it's more like how I look at them is it's just more the games industry continuing to grow and they're they're big players in that because of their ability to develop games and what they've done in the past as well, right? People have leveraged these engines for a while now and um, they'll continue to do so in the future. But I also believe there will be a lot of continued work in the proprietary game engine field by a lot of companies that will allow them to, you know, uniquely and distinctly separate themselves from their, their peers. Okay. Um, now, what do you think? We've talked about some misperceptions. What are there any others that that uh, you think the gaming industry suffers from? Um, I think a lot of it now is you know people are starting to recognize that the space is really big. It's a huge revenue driver. It's the biggest. Um, it's the biggest revenue driver in all of entertainment, right? So I think people are starting to recognize, you know, in Hollywood and the music industry that the games industry is much bigger. And the argument used to be this games are $59.99, but now as you go to this free to play model and digital spends, I think uh I think th those arguments aren't holding water anymore. And there's appreciation that the size is real and it's something that needs acknowledged. Um I think what people are starting to learn now is the the game watching element, right? Like, wait, you know, I think it's really hard for people to fathom that the size of people that watch other people play video games. And even I, as the head of gaming at YouTube, struggled with this concept, you know, seven or eight years ago because I hated watching my brother play video games growing up. Like, I, I was like, couldn't wait for him to die, so it was my time to play. Um, and so I think that's the next one. Like, people get esports because it's like, all right, traditional sports, you're watching this kind of competition tournament format for a prize. That's pretty digestible to most people to at least at a high level understand that conceptually. But this idea that there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that are logged into YouTube that are coming in every single day to watch gaming video, um, I think is a is is new. Um, and I think that's one where there's still not a, enough appreciation about the size and scale, which is kind of why I let off the QA with that little Netflix tidbit. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so let's, uh, I know we've done a lot in terms of the future. And of course, as investors, we're think, trying to think about the future five years from now. What do the popular games look like? And, you know, are there any other technological breakthroughs that will serve to, you know, again, uh, gaming is already one of the, or the largest entertainment vertical and new technologies will continue to build on on old ones to leverage that. Uh, so what do the popular games look like in your view? And uh, and any other uh, any other thoughts you have on on where technology is taking us? <clears throat> yeah, there's a couple of things that I think are really interesting that will happen over the next five years. Um, 
One, we look at the live streaming space, right? Which I think is really interesting. When we look at all gaming watch time on all platforms outside of China, right? Um, and we look at all, all of the gaming watch time that's happening, you know, across video content, it's um, 17%, right? So VOD is going to always be the substantial driver of gaming watch time. But live streaming has always been very exciting because it unlocks this different content format that tells a different story that can only be told in live. And from a creator's perspective, it's very interesting because it provides a level of interactivity with the users that are participating in real time. As I see this world of these lines blurring, and when I say like blurring between watching and playing, is that like you might be watching gaming video and playing at the same time. You might be able to change the dynamics of a game that I'm playing while watching me, right? And so I think these lines will continue to blur. And because of that, I feel live streaming is really important. I think people over-index on the conversation of it relative to its size. I mean, it's like I said, it's substantially smaller than VOD upload content, but it is a very interesting space long-term for these reasons. And so YouTube is heavily invested in this space, live streaming overall, right? Um, YouTube is, but really particularly what we're doing in gaming, and that's continuing to be a, a focal point and something to look out for, because I do think it will impact to your initial question, what are the like? What is what do game development and what does success in games development look like? I think if you don't have a gaming video strategy as part of your game development strategy, you will not have substantial success in generating these kind of Minecraft, Fortnite esque numbers, right? I think there needs to be an appreciation of the creator ecosystem, the users that watch and play, and how you build. Uh, how you build that as part of the development process. And you're seeing a lot more publishers do this. That will continue to happen in that direction. But those are things that I would want to check off and say, okay, they're doing these things. They're mindful of the creator ecosystem, the viewer ecosystem, as well as the game player and how these things all operate with each other. I think it's really important. Two, where I see games going more specifically is kind of going back to that, what I call like games as a service. I think you are going to see this model. It's a little scary, especially when you're launching them in a free-to-play model. You know, you put all of these years and all of this money and investment and hard work into it, and you hope that it pays off when this game comes out and is free to everybody. It is a, it's, you know, it's kind of like leap and the net will appear type of investment, but it's it's really where the, the, the industry, I think, is going in a meaningful way. Um, there's a game that just came out called Genshin Impact, right? That's having, it's a mobile gaming first uh, free to play and it's having this huge impact on, on revenue and people are buying left and right. And so you're going to see games be bigger, more open world, more inclusive, um, available on all devices, right? Because there's this appreciation that gamers are playing everywhere. So I want to play on my PC, you know, after this, I go jump on my mobile device and can play that same game. So I think cross platform is really important. I think games as a service where they're iterating and, and constantly providing fresh content to the user, whether it's updates to the story, whether it's digital good items, these are the games that you're going to see that are really going to succeed. And I say that they're really going to succeed, not absent of AAA, but I say they're going to succeed because they are going to be so big to the Twitch, the Facebook gaming, the YouTube gaming platforms. And I think those are going to be really important anchors long-term in the games industry. Yeah, and uh, this is the last question. You know, uh, they're becoming social networks, of course. Right. And, you know, when I saw in Fortnite uh, the Party Royale Island, I was saying, whoa, whoa, could this really evolve into a social network in a way that no one's thinking about right now? I think, what do you think? I think, I think it's a great observation. And look at what they've done. They are building these fun communities, sub communities within there. I mean, people are going to watch anything from the new Star Wars trailer to a concert. And, you know, you look at that Fortnite, they did the Travis Scott event. Yeah. They, they published how many people wa are, were actually in the game playing. The numbers of people watching, like if you looked at it, um, you know, there was six to seven million concurrent live viewers watching creators stream that event, right? So this was one of the biggest entertainment launches in history, right? Based off of people watching, people participating, and the conversation it generated. And it honestly missed some people's radar, which is astonishing. Like it, you, you don't get bigger than these moments, right? Um, right. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I think those moments need to continue to happen to catch people's attention. And I'm looking forward to YouTube being the one that, that generates those moments. 
Well, I want to thank you so much, Ryan. You have provided us and uh, with so many insights that I don't think we would have had otherwise. And and we will wish you every success. You're in such a burgeoning space. You're doing such a great job. And uh, and we just thank you for sharing your insights with us. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me on. Have a good rest of the summit. And uh, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch on the games industry. All right. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to take a one minute break. And when we come back, Tasha Keeney, will, our analyst on drones, will interview Adam Bree, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Skydio on all things drones. Welcome back. As Kathy mentioned, I'm Tasha Keeney, one of ARC's autonomous technology and robotics analysts. And today I'm here with Adam Bree. Adam is CEO and co-founder of Skydio, a U.S. drone manufacturer and a world leader in autonomous flight. He has over two decades of experience in the unmanned aerial system space. He was part of the award-winning project at MIT that pioneered autonomous flight. And Adam also co-founded Google's Project Wing. Thanks so much for joining us today, Adam. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So, you know, I'd love to start off and, and just ask you, um, why did you start Skydio and what is Skydio trying to achieve? Um, so I, I grew up flying radio controlled airplanes, which were kind of the predecessors to drones. Um, so I took it way too seriously as a kid. I actually traveled all over the country flying in aerobatic competitions. Um, and that's really what got me interested in engineering. And then I was fortunate to be starting grad school at MIT around the time when you could essentially take RC airplanes and start to put computers and sensors on them and, and get them to do smart stuff. Um, and I just got addicted to the challenge of, of trying to write software that could do things at or beyond the capabilities of the best human pilots in the world. Um, so I kind of stopped trying to be a good radio control pilot myself and, and started focusing on, on writing software systems that could do a lot of the things that, that experts were capable of. Um, that's where I met my co-founders, uh, Abe and Matt, so we were working on this stuff at MIT mainly because it was interesting and challenging. Um, this was kind of late 2000s period. Uh, and the motivation for starting Skydio was looking out and starting to see the opportunity for drones come into focus. Uh, you know, 2013, 2014, people were starting to talk about all the amazing consumer possibilities um, and all the amazing industrial commercial um, applications and opportunities. And we felt like all that stuff was was really compelling, but that it wasn't really going to work the way that people wanted it to, and unless you could trust the drone to fly itself. Um, and it's stuff that we knew a lot about and loved working on from our background. So at the most basic level, that's what motivated us to start the company is just feeling like there was enormous potential here in this industry. Uh, and there was kind of this key foundational piece that we we knew a lot about and and loved working on. Um, and that's really what we're what we're about today. So I I think the story is, is largely the same, but we're actually starting to see these possibilities come to life with our customers. So at the end of last year, we launched Skydio 2, which from a consumer prop perspective is is uh, it's like a fully autonomous film crew. Like you can put the thing in the air, it follows people around, it avoids obstacles, it takes amazing video, and it, it kind of replicates. It's like you had an expert drone pilot out there with you, or you had a Hollywood film crew, all that capability is available. Uh, to, to somebody to, to take with them for their adventures, hiking, biking, skiing, or just playing in a park with their kids. Um, and we have customers generating all sorts of amazing video there now. Um, and then on the, the kind of enterprise and, and government side of things, this has always been part of our vision, but that market has taken longer to mature, but we're, we're seeing that really come into focus now as well. And, and we have, um, you know, we have customers doing all sorts of, of inspection mapping type tasks where, you're making the world run more efficiently by by keeping track of how infrastructure is running. So, for example, energy utilities inspecting their transmission towers, or um, you know, uh, departments of transportation inspecting bridges. Um, and you're also keeping the operators safer. Like these are tasks that oftentimes getting these inspections requires really putting people at at risk and and doing it with a drone. Um, you can you can get better data and do it in a safer, more efficient way. So, for us as a company, I mean, this is really what we're about. Like we want to make the world a better place using autonomous drone technology. And I, I think this is still very early. It's a it's a new category of device that's still kind of in its infancy. Great. Yeah. So um what do you, you know, Skydio is obviously a clear leader in autonomous flight. Um, 
you know, what what do you have that that other companies haven't really been able to to solve for? Um, you know, what what sort of sets you apart and, and allows you to you know hold that that leader position? Uh, so, so the the product and the technology is really just a direct reflection of the team of people that's working on it, and I think really what sets us apart, um, you know, I, the, in a lot of cases with drones, the concepts have been relatively easy to imagine, you know, this idea of a drone that follows you around and takes cool video, that concept is pretty easy to imagine. A lot of people have, have thought about it or, or marketed it. Um, but I think what, what sets us apart as a company is that we've been able to really like buckle down and solve a lot of the core technology challenges that are necessary to make these things come to life. Um, and our ability to do that is, is a reflection of the group of people that we have. And we're, we're fortunate to just have an amazing group of folks on hardware and software and now um, operations, manufacturing, marketing, sales, everything that it takes to, to make these things really happen and, and come to life. So I think that's that's far and away the number one factor. Um, you know, I think that we've, by virtue of having a really good team, I think we've, we've made some kind of core architectural bets on, you know, treating the device like a flying computer, investing very heavily in um, a very flexible software system that enables us to to build up this excuse me build up this functionality um, and and rapidly advance capabilities uh, so you know I think there's there's a few factors like that 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 are all coming together and and what do you see as, as your next steps um, you know I've heard you say in interviews before that in some applications like uh, a human pilot you know the the most pro pilots might actually um, in, in some ways sort of beat the drone or do certain things better. So um, yeah, what's what's the state of things in autonomous flight and and sort of what's what's the path forward from here? Uh, so I, you know, my, our overall outlook on the industry, I think is informed by how early we believe it is. Um, you know, this is a big part of what motivated us to start the company. Uh, but if you look at, um, if you look at the, the way the drones are used today, how they're used, where they're used, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening and they're becoming more and more standard in industries like construction, energy, um, you know, public safety. Uh, so there's, there's real use happening and they're, they're helping people do their jobs better, but it's still, I think just a fraction of, of what's ultimately possible. Um, and, you know, I think there's a regulatory component to that. There's also just kind of a customer adoption and, and societal, accept its element, but I think there's also a lot of product pieces as well. Um, so we're, we're most focused on the autonomy piece because we think that's kind of the biggest lever. It's, it's sort of what pushes drones into the software regime. Um, you know, and I think an analogy that none of these analogies are perfect, but I think another way to think about this is kind of the, you know, the transition in the early days of the PC industry from these kind of hobbyist hacker devices that the most dedicated, enthusiastic people could get value out of, um, but you had to really learn how to program the device before you could do something useful with it to uh, the graphical user interface with Microsoft Windows and the Mac, uh, which turned the PC into like a really software defined thing um, with a huge wealth of applications that span a lot of different uh, industries and, and users. And I think that's, that's what we believe autonomy does for drones. It turns it into a software defined experience where if you can write software that solves a particular problem, like say house inspection, um, that capability then becomes available to all your users uh, out in the world whenever they want to use it. Um, and I think we're still very early in in that coming to fruition. So for example, you know, I mentioned roof inspection, like we're, we're working with Eagle View, which is a leader in the insurance claims processing space, uh, rolling out a, a fully automated residential roof inspection product um, and we're incredibly excited about that, but even within that industry <clears throat> and as large as that, that deployment is, it's still, you know, single digit percentages of like covering that entire market. And that's just one use case. And that same thing exists for energy utilities, for transmission tower inspection or for construction sites. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do as a company, um, to, to make the products and the tech good enough that it's robust to serve all these things and then building out the capabilities that that make all these um, all these use cases really sing the way that they should, um, and that's kind of I think that's just sort of the story of technology. Like the more the easier these things become to use, like the more it just becomes you push a few few buttons and the the task gets completed. The the broader adoption is, and then the more interesting stuff gets built on top of that. Okay, and you're you're actually touching on another one of my questions. So so what do you what do you see as the the um, the biggest bottleneck or, or sort of you know 
focus area um, to to enable adoption? Is it is it regulation? Is it improvements in the technology for these um, specific applications? Is it is it education on the customer side? Uh, so you know, I'm I'm probably biased, and I think we tend to look at things more through a, a product and technology lens because that's the stuff that we have the most control over. Uh, but I, I think that's where I think that's where there's the most work to do. Um, you know, I think that regulation <clears throat> has sometimes been a, a punching bag for the industry. Of you know, companies will say like, "Oh, we could be doing all this amazing stuff if if regulators weren't holding us down." And certainly, there are areas where it would be nice if certain things were allowed. But but by and large, I think the regulation that's out there today is um, is reasonable, given you know a world where you have manually flown drones where you need an expert pilot there to fly it. And I think it's on us as an industry to get the technology to the point where that's not the case and then demonstrate the the value that it has for customers and the safety case around it. Um, and when that's happened, I think you see you see regulators responding to that. So for example, we we work with the FAA and the North Carolina Department of Transportation to get a first of its kind waiver for beyond visual line of sight flight um, that spans the entire state of North Carolina for bridge inspection. Um, and and we were able to get that because we were able to show that you know when our drones are flying themselves based on computer vision in close proximity to bridges, um, you know they don't pose any risk to manned aircraft because they're so close to the structure. And there's steps that we can take to make sure that everybody on the ground is safe. Um, and you know beyond visual line of sight flight is this thing that's been sort of talked about as like the FAA needs to open this up in order for the industry to move forward. But I think that's a case where you know we were able to show the product and tech was there. There's a customer using it, and um, you know. It, we, we got the approvals we need for the customer to um, to do what they need to do. So I, I think the I think it's really I you know my perspective I think it's on us as an industry to build the products and the tech that make these things incredibly valuable to customers such that they're like you know they're banging down to the door to get it and telling regulators that hey we need this unlocked um, and and when we've seen those pieces come together I think we've seen reasonable regulation um, fall into place. So the I think the next wave in terms of you know where the products and the technology need to go. I think the next wave is really around persistent internet connectivity for the drone itself, um, providing massive leverage for the operators where you can have drones that live in boxes that are connected to the internet that fly themselves whenever they need to. And a single operator can deploy one or 10 or hundreds of drones to go off and perform a particular task or set of tasks uh, with, with huge, huge leverage. And then the data all flows seamlessly back up to the cloud uh, and and you know, I, I think that's to me that's the future of the industry. And and you can look at a lot of what we're doing now is laying the the building blocks and the foundations to enable that future to come to life. Interesting. And so for that communication piece, um, is is that would you want sort of more infrastructure to be built out to to help with that connectivity, or um, is this again sort of more on the product development side that you're thinking of things? Well, there's a lot. I mean, most of most of the developed world has has pretty good 4G coverage, um, and uh, I think that's a sufficient starting point for a lot of this to exist. Um, and that's the way we're, you know, that's what we're doing um, is is working with within the existing infrastructure. I certainly think that, you know, I, I generally view us and I think drones as a customer of this. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of folks working on excuse me, improving um, wireless internet connectivity around the world um, through 4G and then 5G and and maybe beaming it down from satellites like Starlink. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of investment happening there. Uh, and I think that's stuff that will naturally benefit from as an industry. Uh, but I don't think we depend on it to do a lot of useful stuff. I mean, even with the inf infrastructure that's already uh, out there today, I think there's uh, there's way more that can be done with drones. Got it. And what do you see as the most exciting applications? I mean, you're working on inspection. Um, of course, Skydio yeah. drones are very good at cin cinematography. Um, are, are there are there any new markets that you think um, are are opening up with drones that didn't exi exist before, and that um, you know people or analysts might not be sort of predicting that that you see coming through? Uh, well, I think there's there's a pretty exciting wide set of applications out there. And I think that's one of the cool things for the industry, but also one of the challenges is there's just so much stuff. Um, so we have, you know, we have customers doing all kinds of inspection tasks. Uh, we're working with a, a customer where that does indoor warehouse inventory monitoring with our drones, where they fly up and down the aisles of warehouses. Um, 
and you know there's there's a pretty exciting wide set of stuff already out there i think with people thinking about it so i don't you know to me the frontier is not necessarily new applications i think the frontier is really like making making the things that you can see sort of working today with the most forward leading customers that are willing to invest a lot of time and money to standing up their programs to working extremely well with very little friction such that they can really be rolled out at scale. Um, so, you know, one example where I, I see the most potential for positive impact, and I think this is also one that carries with it some controversy, but I, I have a pretty strong perspective on is um, this notion of a drone as first responder, uh, we call like the acronym we use internally is, is DFR, uh, where you can basically send a drone to the scene of a 911 call to get real time situational awareness in a matter of seconds rather than minutes or tens of minutes for somebody to get there on the ground. Um, and I think that this is, this is something to me that I think has the potential to really transform policing for the better, um, where, you know, you imagine if you're at a 911 call where a crime is being committed, like being able to have a drone there to capture what's happening, provide information to the 911 operator, uh, I think is, one just going to be like a, a really powerful crime prevention tool, but it's also going to be a life-saving thing, like equipping officers with the knowledge that the suspect is armed or they're not armed or, you know, whatever the details of the situation are such that they can respond appropriately. Uh, I think we'll, we'll keep community safer um, and allow or allow police to do, to do a better job. So that's, that's something that um, I'm, you know, I'm particularly excited about. I think it's also not controversy free, you know, the idea of equipping, police with drones that fly overhead and, and maybe can be abused to surveil cities proactively, you know, it carries a lot of other, um, a lot of other things associated with it. And I think as, you know, as an industry and as a company and stuff that we need to think about, uh, but you know, that, that's one example, but I think there's a lot of things out there like that, where it's just a fundamental step change where drones enable, um, something to, to be done way safer and in a way more cost-effective way, like for policing, the, benchmark or something that you might compare against is the cost of a manned helicopter that costs, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars an hour per op of operation is incredibly, um, expensive and noisy and dangerous. Like when those things crash, they kill people. Uh, and so the, you know, the, when you take that down and put it into something that costs a few thousand dollars and flies itself, it's just a totally different, different use paradigm. So that, that brings me to one of my other questions, which is, you know, what sort of cost dynamics do you see here? Um, in a lot of cases, we've seen autonomous technology can reduce the cost of a human in the loop system by at least a tenth. But, you know, you just gave a clear example of the, where that could be much higher. Um, yeah. What, what do you sort of see broadly in, in different applications in terms of that, that cost reduction factor? How should we be thinking about that? I mean, I think it, it varies. Um, it varies quite a bit by application, but it's really significant, as you say. I mean, it's like a factor of 10 to 100 is is um, if you're comparing against like a, a manned aircraft system uh, is is oftentimes where you'll land. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a big enough change that I think it it just changes the way things work fundamentally. Like there's all kinds of tasks where it wouldn't make any sense to send a, a manned helicopter out to look at it or do that task that become no brainer to send a drone out to do it. Um, so you know, I, I think that that's, um, that's a, a really powerful factor for the, the industry. And, you know, you also mentioned that, um, uh, for, so forward thinking customers, uh, you know, that are sort of willing to adopt drones and, and sort of want to integrate with the technology are an important piece of the puzzle. Um, what do you see as the most yeah, forward thinking uh, companies or maybe just industries or even even countries um, that are that are very accepting of drones. Sort of who, who's leading the way here? We've seen a lot of um, forward leaning customers in places where people might not typically expect to, to see forward leaning customers. I mean, a lot of like the sort of oldest industries, the industries that operate, you know, like the rail industry um, or uh, energy utilities or, um, you know, police police departments and fire departments, I think within each of those industries, um, we've, you know, we've been really fortunate and excited to find uh, people and organizations that are uh, really excited about new technology and see the potential and lean into it uh, and, and oftentimes organically find ways to deploy it. So a very common pattern that 
you'll see, especially with the drone programs that have been around the longest is there was often a drone enthusiast who was kind of a hobbyist hacker who had a personal interest themselves who had drones and they started bringing them to work and they started finding all these interesting, cool use cases for them. Um, and that's oftentimes how these, these programs started. And then a lot of the companies will really lean into it once they see the potential. Uh, in terms of countries, um, so, you know, a few off the top of my head, like Japan uh, has, I think, a really um, favorable outlook where they generally like lean into robots and like deploying robots to do useful tasks. Um, there's also a lot of infrastructure in Japan um, for a relatively small land area. They've got a huge number, you know, they've got a lot of cell towers and uh, energy distribution and bridges. Uh, and so we see a lot of, of exciting activity in Japan. I think Australia is another one um, where I think they've, as a country, they've done a, a, a really good job leaning in and they've got a regulatory framework uh, to support that. Same thing in Japan. Uh, there's there's a lot of really interesting interesting drone companies uh, in in Australia working on various pieces of the of the technology stack. Great. And then um, during the pandemic, um, how do you think that's affected the the adoption of this technology? Um, you know, I've heard you say that certainly on the manufacturing side, um, there's been some disruptions. But um, what, what have you seen in terms of, um, yeah, sort of from the demand pull side, uh, um, what, if, what if in the past year, what's what's been going on? So I think from a, a demand and a pull perspective, I think um, COVID has in many cases like really highlighted how useful and how important drones can be um, because it, you know, fundamentally it's just, it provides more leverage for, for companies and for operators to get things done um, with, without needing to send huge teams of people out in the field to, to do a particular kind of say inspection task. Uh, and we've certainly seen that with our, our customers. Um, it's not true across the board, but in, in most categories, we've seen interest um, and demand by their stay constant or go up with coronavirus, which I think when you compare that to um, general economic pressure downwards, uh, says a lot about the the technology uh, and and uh, the the demand that's out there. Um, so you know, I think there's, if anything, I would say the industry is likely to be positively impacted. But it certainly, um, you know, we and our customers and everybody else, I think, just has increased friction in getting anything done. Um, because it's harder to travel, uh, it's, you know, there's supply chain disruption and, and things like that. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, we're dealing with that the same way that, that everybody else is. Okay. And so I, I'm curious to get your thoughts, um, you know, that we have in, in the drone space, there's some military companies that have moved into commercial applications. Um, and, you know, Skydio's started with more consumer applications now moving towards the, the commercial side. Um, how do you see uh, players like yourself uh, versus those those military drone makers now sort of um, perhaps competing in the same field? Uh, well, I, I like our position. I think that it's, um, yeah, I think you can see this in other categories. The pace of innovation and the pace of technology development that comes out of the kind of consumer enterprise, high technology way of thinking uh, is, is really, really hard to match. And I think you've, you've seen that crossover happen in lots of, of places. Um, you know, there's obvious examples like uh, Microsoft has a, a really significant government and defense business basically selling products that were developed either for consumers or for enterprise customers. Um, into to defense customers. And, you know, most soldiers now carry a government issued smartphone um, that was not designed from the ground up to be uh, a, a soldier phone, but it was, you know, it's riding the backs of like massive investment in processors and cameras and operating systems for, for smartphones. Um, it's a similar story in the cloud. You know, the, the government at this point relies on, um, well, we'll see. I don't know if that contract is settled, but uh, between AWS and Azure um, is relying on on cloud technology that was primarily developed um, for for commercial enterprise users. And I think drones have a lot of the same dynamics where there's a lot of really advanced technology. AI is a huge component of it and the fast product iteration cycles that companies that are, are playing in the consumer commercial world uh, tend to operate on just get you to like a fundamentally better place in terms of cost, size, weight, performance. Um, 
So, uh, and you know, this has always been, wasn't clear exactly when it was going to happen. This had always been kind of our, a big part of our vision and why we decided to start where we did with the kind of consumer product foundation. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the, the companies that are going the other direction know this, um, you know, the companies that are, are more traditionally defense oriented, I think recognize the kind of shift that's happening and they're trying to, um, to adapt. Uh, and, you know, they have some advantages by being kind of incumbents and having close relationships with all the customers and being on a lot of these kind of government programs records. But uh, I think you're going to see the best products come from the other direction. Okay. And and broadly, where, where do you see the industry going in the next five years? Um, what do you what do you expect to happen over that time? Uh so I, I think this is maybe not the most exciting answer, but I think it's a real one. I think that what you're going to see a lot of is things that are sort of working today um, with a few customers and companies work way better and reach many more customers. Um, I think there's there's going to be some new applications, but uh, I think that the the basic story is going to be um, things that that customers are the most enterprising customers are leaning forward and, and, and piecing together solutions. Now, I think, um, those things will get integrated. They'll get more automated, uh, and they will be just way better functioning products that, that way more people can use and take advantage of. Uh, and then the other, the other big shift, which I think is coming over that time frame, which is, is really part of the same story is, um, the shift towards the drone being internet connected and living in its own kind of box charging dock home um, so that drones really become infrastructure that's installed uh, and you can access it over the internet. It can fly itself on demand uh, or it can fly in a regular schedule, whatever it needs to do to do the kinds of like routine inspection, security uh, mapping type tasks that are required. And, and that's a really big deal because then it just, then the whole thing is, is really defined by software. You know, you don't need an operator on the ground um, for a lot of these these tasks, you can uh, dispatch the drone uh, through the internet. And the the other the other misconception I'd point out here, I think some people sort of point at this as like, oh, it's you know it's eliminating the task of the drone operator, but really what it's doing is it's just making them way way more effective. Where rather than having you know a one to one mapping with people in the field, you can have one person uh, deploying like a, a huge fleet to just get way more done. Okay. Um, and then last question, uh, what did I, what did I not ask you that you think, um, you know, our, our viewers should be looking out for, um, next in the industry or, or with Skydio? Uh, that's a good question. We covered a lot of ground. Um, the overall thing that I'd say is to, to not get too fixated on the way things are now, because I think that the, I think people can kind of make the mistake of looking out and seeing what a drone is now and seeing how people use it and thinking that's like, that's the way it's, it's always going to be. Uh, but I think we're, we're still very, very early, like, you know, comparing it again, I use the PC analogy, like it's, we're probably in the, the, like, you know, early eighties of PCs. And if you look at everything that happened between like the, um, the Mac and the products really reach, I mean, arguably like the smartphone is the continual evol evolution of the PC. Like the thing is still evolving. Um, so I, I still think we've got a lot of, of pretty interesting and disruptive innovation cycles within drones, um, more and more from a software standpoint, but, but things that I think fundamentally change, like who uses them, how they use them, um, and, and what they're capable of. Okay. Great advice. There's uh, disruptive innovation within within disruptive innovation in a, in a way happening here. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us today, Adam. Uh, so great to speak with you. And I, I, I certainly learned a lot. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Tasha. This was great. Thanks for having me. We will now take a one minute break. And when we come back, ARC's Director of Research, Brett Winton, will interview Kathy Wood on the market and investing in disruptive innovation.
Welcome back to Biz 2020, Volume 3. As Tasha mentioned, I'm Brett Winton. I direct research at ARK Invest, and I'm pleased to be joined by Kathy Wood, who is, uh, has over 30, 40 years ex of experience identifying and investing in innovation. Um, Kathy founded ARK to focus solely on disruptive innovation while adding new dimensions to research. Uh, I've worked with Kathy for um, over a dozen years, uh, and I've really enjoyed it throughout the process. Uh, we use an open approach that cuts across sectors, market capitalization, and geographies. And Kathy believes, and I believe, that art can identify large-scale investment opportunities resulting from technological innovation centered around DNA sequencing, robotics, artificial intelligence, energy storage, and blockchain technology. Kathy, how are you? I'm great, Fred. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, <laughs> So as, as I stated, we believe there are five fundamental innovation platforms entering the economic marketplace today, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, DNA sequencing, and blockchain technology. Uh, talk about within kind of the scope of your history, looking at technology and markets, how do we know that these are fundamental technology platforms? And then also, how do we separate kind of this wheat from the chaff? Like, what are some examples of, of things that weren't ready for prime time, or how do we know that we're ready for prime time now with these particular technologies? Sure. Uh, well, I think we learned a lot about true innovation platforms during the tech and telecom bubble. Uh, and what we saw back then were uh, companies who were evolving, who called themselves platform companies, and uh, this dream of the internet and dream of personalized medicine. Uh, and uh, what we learned back then, uh, the difficult way uh, in the tech and telecom bust, is that these technologies and platforms were not ready for prime time. So uh, we, uh, we sought to figure out how can we identify these, ident these innovation platforms and understand when they are ready for prime time. Uh, and uh, we focused on costs. Uh, technology, technologically enabled innovation, uh, typically follows uh, a pattern of cost declines. And what we learned in the internet bubble was the costs were way too high, the technologies weren't ready. Uh, and as we've evolved our strategy, we thought, okay, Moore's law sounds like it's on to something. And it certainly was in the semiconductor sector. Uh, but as Moore's law was hitting a wall, or as we were perceiving a slowing down, we're saying there has to be something else out there. And Wright's law is what we centered our um, research on. And Wright's law says for every cumulative doubling, in the number of units produced, costs decline at a consistent rate. So today, uh, these five innovation platforms that Brett mentioned have all hit tipping points from a cost point of view. Points where for every percentage decline in costs, uh, demand really picks up. In fact, uh, uh, we unleash waves of demand as costs come down. And the waves come not just from one sector, but many sectors. So cost declines, very important. Uh, and then the second characteristic of a true innovation platform is that it does cut across economic sectors. Uh, it is not isolated to one sector uh, and it spreads very quickly. And then the third characteristic is uh, these platforms are launching pads for more innovation. And so those three characteristics describe the five innovation platforms, which involve 14 different technologies uh, that, that Brett mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think about that cross-sector portion is, is almost being key to, to measuring when something's ready for, for true inflection. As in, you know, if you think about um, within the context of even computers, back in the uh, 60s, uh, it's like only nation states can afford a computer. So you needed to begin to have, uh, be at a price point where multiple different kinds of buyers can begin to buy the technology. And then that unlocks and, and gets the flywheel spinning to allow the innovation to continue down yes. in, in price. Very exciting. Um, 
And we've never had five at the same time. Never, never. You have to go back to the early 1900s, uh, the technologically enabled innovations of the day, uh, electricity, automobiles, telephone, they're all very mature now, but those were the exponential growth opportunities back then. And they followed cost declines and unleashed, as we now know, waves and waves of demand across the world. Um, do you think that, so people often ask me, and I'm sure they ask you, uh, what about factors that could derail innovation? We've just gone through like an extremely tumultuous macroeconomic at least episode ongoing, uh, and, and coronavirus has clearly upended lots of people's lives. How have you seen kind of innovation respond to disruption itself from a macro, macroeconomic perspective? Yeah, well, I've been through a number of crises in, in my, crises in my 40 plus years in the business, and I have always seen innovation take off uh, in response to crises. Uh, uh, you know, better, cheaper, faster, more creative products and services to salvage revenue growth and and uh, profit growth. So when the coronavirus hit, uh, and everyone was wondering uh, if we were going to be in a death spiral and, and in a in a depression, uh, we started beating the drum again. Innovation gains traction during tough, tough times. Uh, because innovation solves problems. And now we have a lot of problems. Uh, so I think that's why this year has been so productive for us. The one time, the one crisis, and I don't think it was a crisis for the world, uh, where we didn't see innovation take off, uh, was in the tech and telecom bust. And that's because the bust was caused by too much capital chasing too few opportunities too soon. The technologies weren't ready. The costs weren't low enough. And we needed 15 to 20 years of gestation in order for these platforms to, to uh, really move into prime time. Do you think, but how do you, like within the context of your experience, how do you know that's not happening right now? How do you know that there's not too much capital going after, I don't know, liquid biopsy within gene sequencing? Like what, yeah. what gives you the confidence that you have? Well, first of all, uh, we do our research, as you know, Brett, very, very <laughs> thoroughly. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we look, our investment time horizon is five years. Uh, we have price targets on all of our stocks, and they are based on top-down research, bottom-up research, uh, a, a, a scoring system that overlays. And uh, we can honestly say, especially from the valuation point of view, uh, that while, yes, we've had a very good uh, year, innovation certainly has had a very good year, um, that the, the exponential growth trajectories uh, that the coronavirus launched, and, and, and we believe uh, they've hit uh, escape velocity, uh, that no matter what happened in the election, and uh, now we know what happened in the election, but even before we were saying the coronavirus has unleashed uh, these uh, innovation platforms to solve a lot of problems, they are uh, moving into exponential growth trajectories. And uh, our valuation says uh, that even for our flagship portfolio at this point, uh, after all of this appreciation, uh, that, the, uh, the, 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 that the minimum hurdle rate of return that we demand, 15%, um, is um, we are, our expectations are well ahead of that for the next five years. So that's 15% at a compound annual rate over five years, a doubling every five years. We are well above that 15% hurdle based on, uh, on our research, both top down and bottom up. Do you think that um, it, it, given you know, recent news, it seems like we may be moving past the crisis. Uh, is it possible that people's kind of behavior and stuff will, will totally reset and it, and it was just like a one-time episode of everybody watching Netflix episodes and then people are gonna go back to normal? Like, 
why not just like assume, well, everybody's going to unplug everything they plugged in and, and <laughs> it'll be life as before. The history of innovation is uh, we tend not to look back. And as I mentioned, the coronavirus was such a swift and severe hit to the global economy that uh, we, uh, uh, we, we pulled huge amounts of innovation forward. We had many companies telling us, we didn't think we'd see this kind of customer for three to five years. Sheryl Sandberg on the Facebook uh, call said, you know, it's very interesting. Online retail was gaining about 100, uh, 100 basis points per year in market share relative to total retail here in the United States. And in the second quarter alone, we went up 400 basis points. So four years in, in one quarter. And, and what's interesting about that, we went to 16%. And, uh, and in my experience, in our experience, that when we see a trend or a market share move past 10, 15%, uh, we have hit escape velocity. There's no turning back. And, uh, and the exponential growth trajectory continues apace. We enter into what's known as the sweet spot of the S-curve. Now, with all of the destruction that has taken place out there in traditional retail, it's hard to believe that we've just entered the sweet spot. But according to our analysis, we have. Do you think, do you think it, I mean, it's kind of like for a while we've been in, in the, the kind of perfect environment for innovation where you have the stimulus for the economy, but everybody's stuck at home. And so, again, everybody has money to spend on Netflix. Um, it, if, if there were to be, a, for one thing, what do you think the odds are that there is like a prolonged macro cyclical slowdown on the back end of this? And then within that context, do you think that then kind of filters into hurting innovation companies? Do you think that's a risk? I actually think something else is going to happen. I think the opposite. I think we've been saying from uh, from the early days of the coronavirus crisis that we were in a V-shaped recovery. And we have so many um, uh, pieces of evidence today that businesses are so far behind where consumption has gone that they are scrambling to catch up. We've had four, I believe it's four quarters of inventory liquidation so there hasn't even been any inventory building right now. And inventories have not kept up with sales growth. So uh, the shelves in some cases are quite slim uh, in terms of the pickings. Uh, so we have, we have that uh, to occur. And if you look at the consumer saving rate, it's still at 14%, way above where we started. Uh, we were at 8% before the coronavirus, which itself was a fairly high rate. So the consumer has a lot of firepower. We saw the capital spending and housing numbers that came out in the GDP report. Uh, they, they are, the capital spending for equipment was up 70% in one quarter. Again, as the world moves towards digitalization, digitizing everything, better, cheaper, faster, more productive. Everyone knows it's possible now. So we really have just started that. And I think if you look at capital spending and housing, those have two of the biggest multipliers in uh, the economy when it comes to future economic activity. The real drag on growth has been government spending. And now uh, we may have gridlock, uh, but uh, the, the drag has been there. And I think that will stabilize. That also actually just a stabilization instead of negative growth will help growth uh, going forward. And we do think uh, innovation is going to be a big part of this recovery. Again, escape velocity. But I will also say that we really believe that there are value stocks out there. And these are not the value stocks that are going to be disrupted by our innovators, but other stocks that have been beaten up just as a general value bear market gain traction. Uh, so we do think uh, value, some of value, is going to have a nice rebound here. So innovation strategies in the market might take a pause, but uh, in terms of the traction that innovation is gaining, that will not take a pause. We do not believe. What about vulnerability to macro cyclical disruption? 
It, 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 do you believe that the, this macro cyclical slowdown could be prolonged? And, and if so, could that begin to kind of infect some of the disruptive innovations and, and kind of drag on their long-term potential? Actually, um, we, have, we think we've been in a V-shaped recovery since the early days of the coronavirus. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think the coronavirus turbocharged it towards innovation, of course. Uh, and what we have now is in more of the, I would say, old economy. Uh, we have a scramble to keep up with consumption. Uh, consumption uh, growth has been blistering, particularly in durables, not so much in services. Inventories have been falling for four consecutive quarters. Businesses are way behind and they're trying to catch up with the consumer. And two of the strongest sectors in the economy have been capital spending and housing, both of which have very big multipliers in terms of future economic growth. Uh, and the consumer is, has a 14.3% saving rate. Before the coronavirus, it was eight. So the consumer has even more firepower. So we think the only drag recently has been government, uh, especially state and local governments, uh, some of them not allowed to run deficits. So they've had to cut back. Uh, now that the economy is recovering, we think they will stabilize and that will also boost growth. Uh, so we think there's a lot of firepower here in the economy and it may uh, benefit uh, many value sectors uh, in the short term. But that's going to be very tricky because we think that the amount of uh, innovation that is occurring today, never seen this much before at the same time, is going to be quite problematic uh, for those uh, industries and companies that are going to be disintermediated, disrupted, if not destroyed. So uh, I think the value world will be a little bit of a minefield. There are certainly major, major value value stocks out there that will deliver a significant uh, upsized uh, returns. But uh, uh, we'd be very careful in that world and, and in the growth world, because again, innovation is moving so rapidly that the disintermediation and disruption is quite dizzying uh, for some companies and industries. How do you think about that? I mean, so you've had a lot of experience with a lot of different kinds of management teams over the years in a lot of different strategic positions, sometimes great strategic positions, sometimes poor strategic decisions. How do you think about and assess when you're meeting with management teams? You know, like what's the secret sauce for them to, to navigate this landscape? How do we think about that? Well, I think we're learning more and more about old DNA and new DNA. You know, Tesla is a great example, um, a very high conviction stock for us, as many people know. And uh, what we needed to know first was, uh, before we even met Tesla, we needed to know, okay, this uh, movement towards electric, are we ready for prime time? Is battery technology ready for prime time? And this movement towards autonomous, is it within our five-year time horizon? And so we took a white sheet of paper, as you know, Brett, because you guided a lot of this research. And we just tried to figure out what kind of cost curve decline are these battery pack systems on? And when will they reach a, a price that is competitive with gas powered vehicles like on a like for like basis? Uh, so we, we, as we're doing that research, we find the companies uh, the visionaries who are driving uh, these new ways of doing things. They, they are the companies usually with visionary managements uh, and a lot of new DNA. Uh, they're not stuck at all in the existing world order. And typically uh, they are dismissed by the traditional world order in early days, uh, which you know the auto manufacturers laughed when Tesla lined the bottom of its cars with quote unquote, cell phone batteries, you know, they just dismissed it. And um, they missed a very, very big disruption. Uh, and now they are scrambling to try and catch up. Uh, the, their DNA is mostly about the internal combustion engine. Their exponential growth opportunity was 100 years ago. Uh, the new exponential growth opportunity is electric and then autonomous. They are not well prepared for that move. 
We think most of them will be disrupted. Uh, I think there'll be huge consolidation in the space, restructuring. Um, so, so we just look, we use our research as our screen, technologies first, which companies are running with these technologies, which are the innovators who are actually creating you know, this new opportunity. And, um, and we follow them closely. Uh, and we're in a world where there are, are many uh, opportunities because of artificial intelligence are, are, well, first they're exponential growth opportunities, but they are also winner take most opportunities. So autonomous, we think will autonomous vehicles and taxi networks, we think will submit to natural geographic monopolies. It's our uh, job to figure out which company is best placed in each geography to become effectively the winner taking most in that opportunity. But, you know, as a research team, we could be pitching you like there's all kinds of, you know, IBM basically talks about every one of the technologies that we focus on. Right. And, and, and I could pick kind of, you know, call it old DNA companies or you could say companies that are already at scale that uh, are talking about, you know, they know how to manufacture things. They just need to transition to electric. Like, why not those companies? What do you think hurts them? Like, why is there old? What does old DNA mean? You know, what it means is um, wh when you think about it, because we haven't had this much innovation occurring at one time, uh, you know, tried and true indexed based strategies. They were very successful for a very long time. Not much was changing. So they did fine and outperformed active managers who were becoming more benchmark sensitive, which was not a good idea, by the way. Um, so now that we're in a period, a period of momentous change, um, we need the right DNA because the, 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 the old DNA typically it, it has R&D budgets, which are focused, they're backwards looking. The world never didn't change for a hundred years. And in their view, I, I remember very well when we started ARC, uh, in their view, electric wasn't going to become relevant for 10 or 15 years. In fact, I think IHS uh, in 2020 expected 250,000 electric vehicles globally. And I think we're on par for, uh, I, I think it's, it's certainly over 2 million. They were tenfold off, an order of magnitude off. Uh, and, and that usually is why we have such an opportunity. The old world doesn't believe that innovation can uh, come on the scene and evolve that quickly, just because it hasn't in the last hundred years. You know, it's funny, I hear you talk about these management teams, I can't help but think of you, Kathy. Uh, like, how do you, in terms of, like, talk a little bit about uh, founding ARC and, and, and how you think about kind of the culture of ARC and, and what we're doing within the context of the investing landscape. Yeah, um, I founded ARC for two reasons. One, to focus only on disruptive innovation because with your help, Brett, you know, we were identifying major opportunities all occurring at once, 14 different technologies involved, and we didn't think the world understood what was about to hit it. Uh, and uh, and in the traditional asset management world, you know, uh, our strategy was considered a little out there, very volatile, very risky. And, uh, and our point of view was, wait a minute, the risk is not in our strategies. The risk is, if not today, within the next three to five years, the risk is in uh, benchmark oriented strategies, backwards looking strategies. Uh, because of the value traps, which are populating them increasingly. Uh, so that was one reason. And then the second reason I felt uh, we needed to start ARC was to add new dimensions to research. We were going to become the first sharing economy company in the asset management space when it came to research. Uh, and if in, in, in the traditional asset management world, a compliance department would never turn itself upside down to oversee a social media and marketing strategy and a social research strategy uh, like uh, I wanted to evolve. And so um, uh, we knew that wasn't going to happen. 
And we figured, okay, well then let's hire people who have worked at the SEC as they've as they've been developing these guidelines for social media and marketing, uh, which applies to research as well. And uh, let's run with this. This is, let's be disruptive. Let's use the technologies that have disrupted other industries and, and move them into the financial services industry and become a bit disrupted of, uh, disruptive ourselves. Uh, not just to be disruptive, but because it was the right thing to do for our clients. Uh, the transparency that we have, our clients love. Uh, the, 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 and that's transparency, not just in research, uh, but also in asset management, we disclose our holdings uh, for the ETFs uh, 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 every day, and we disclose our trades uh, at the end of every day. And the other part of the social strategy that was a win-win, more so than I ever dreamed at the time, was as our analysts push their research into social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Medium, Telegram, any social network that they thought could help them engage with the communities they were researching. Uh, as they were doing that, what happened is the engagement we had coming back to us was amazing. In the sharing economy, if you don't give, you won't get. And most asset managers will allow their analysts and portfolio managers now, not when I was in the traditional world, but now I think they allow them to look at Twitter, but they, do not allow them to actually participate. Yeah, I remember having to get a special dispensation to like access uh, Twitter when I was researching it back, and, back in the day. So, and LinkedIn yeah. as well. We couldn't yeah. access LinkedIn. Right. It's, yeah. uh, it is, I mean, I'd say from the research side, I think having to, to be transparent about what you're doing also um, increases the quality of the underlying research. It makes the analysts share more completely internally as well as externally. And then the, the, you know, the results in some ways speak for themselves. But that, I guess I'm also getting it like, you know, you are Kathy Wood starting ARC and, and I'm on the other side and I'm saying, listen, actively traded ETFs, that's something that doesn't really exist. Why do that? Uh, why call yourself a thematic manager when growth equities is a box you could fit into? Why start something that would be available to retail clients when you could do, you know, a hedge fund? Like I could say all those things. How do you like um, and and also I could say to you, why are you buying Tesla when it's down below two hundred dollars? It's you know, it, you're, you're crazy. Like, can you talk about even within the context of your career, how you have that kind of strong like instinct for what to do and, and stick by your principles? Uh, I think I learned really early in the business that when everyone is moving in one direction and, 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 and they're sure that that's the way the world's going to work, and we see reasons that that is incorrect and move in the other direction, the rewards can be enormous. Um, and I learned it very early, more with my economics hat on, uh, at, at, in the early 80s, when inflation and interest rates were in the double digits, I was very young in my career, new to the career. And um, I had my mentor, Art Laffer, uh, taught me well enough. So I thought I knew how the world worked. And so uh, I was bringing up a lot of uh, reasons why inflation and interest rates were going to peak. And we were going into the golden age of, of investing. And of course, everyone wanted to hear that, but uh, they mostly wanted to pat me on the head and said, yes, yes, very nice, very nice, <laughs> good luck. And so going up against Henry Kaufman, Al Wojnarowski, Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman, and th they, they were saying that inflation and interest rates were baked into the cake at a double digit rate, that this was, this was intractable. And uh, just coming up with different way, proof points. It actually was coming down and nobody was giving the lower rates, lower inflation school any, and there weren't many of us, any credibility. Uh, that's when I really love it. And so active ETFs, we saw the share shift towards ETFs after the 0809 crisis, because that's what we do. We'd study disruptive innovation. And we said, well, why couldn't an active manager 
uh, manage an, uh, an ETF. It's a wrapper. It, it looks like it's really good for the end investor. Uh, you know, better, cheaper, faster, everything we say about innovation. Uh, and so we started that way. And uh, again, people dismissed us, just active, did not belong, was active, was dead. And it actually made me feel good because I, I thought, wow, everybody really believes this. And uh, I don't understand why. They can't, they really can't explain to me why. And that's because they didn't understand active management, which I didn't understand until I entered into the ETF space. I did not understand that we were talking different languages. Um, I, in terms of the, the hedge fund versus uh, an ETF wrapper, uh, we're in many wrappers now, but um, you know, we wanted to democratize investing. And uh, you know, there are, uh, there's a huge intergenerational transfer of wealth starting to take place as the baby boomers uh, retire and pass on. And, uh, and, and this new generation really wants to understand what they're buying. They love the transparency uh, and they, they love you know, uh, following us on social media, especially when there's one big controversy. Tesla, of course, has been uh, a wonder, wonderful way to showcase our research because we were uh, thinking that electric was uh, possible from a scaling exponentially point of view. Uh, within five years of the starting of the company, we started in 2014, and that uh, certainly has proved uh, correct. And um, and we had the model again centered on Wright's law. That's critical to our analysis. Uh, uh, that such that we were watching the numbers coming out, and they were and they were uh, following the model that we had put in place. But because most analysts out there were, weren't even considering electric as relevant for 10 years, um, you know, we had to convince the public. So I think uh, our way of doing research, the courage of my conviction born out of our research and, you know, standing on the shoulders of you and our analysts, you know, I was able to suffer through the slings and arrows. And I, w I didn't even consider it suffering because I knew we were onto something big. And I know we're onto five big platforms and rights law is working in each of them. So, you know, those are, those are some of the reasons. I'm not sure if I answered every single question you just asked, Brett, but that was my attempt. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, from from a certainly a research department's perspective there there is a big difference between being able to lay out well this is the work that we've done and not being worried about somebody tapping you on the shoulder you know like as in like we we can be wrong and we are and you can be wrong uh and but the process of learning that we're wrong is also like a kind of a dialogue and a conversation and it allows us to you know continue to search for for the future truth uh and um and, yeah, I, can and tell, I can tell a story about that having to do with you so uh uh brett was uh the lead analyst on our thematic research team in our former uh firm and um we got this notion that virtual worlds could become a thing and Brett, I think it was in 2005 or six, was going to Japan and the rest of Asia to understand what was going on. And we came back to the, uh, he came back to the US and we started uh, talking about virtual worlds in the context of, well, WebEx is one example of this. And then what do you know, uh, Cisco buys WebEx and then IBM starts talking about avatars and giving giving its service away for free. And we're saying, okay, this is going nowhere fast. And so, but the, in the course of doing uh, uh, his research, Brett uh, surfaced uh, relevant variables and they were surfacing in Asia. We weren't as much focused in Asia at that time. Uh, and they've informed our decision-making um, in terms of, well, certainly social networking 
uh, with time and how exponentially uh, that was going to grow. Uh, and now with virtual reality, you know, we were looking at the big goggles, you know, four years ago, and we were saying not ready for prime time, too expensive, and now maybe moving into prime time. And so this concept of virtual worlds and the metaverse is is taking on new meaning. And but we've been thinking about it for so long, for 14, 15 years. Uh, and and so we've been waiting, and uh, now we believe it's happening. Well, right. And so being able to like kind of within a certain like innovation lens uh, dimension kind of the business models that might work and and how they're going to play out and it informs your perspective on on like the incremental businesses that are building towards that future um, mm -hmm. so it's been it's been six years i guess since you started arc mm -hmm. uh, here we are in 2020 uh, i guess late 2014 was the start uh, of the six fun. years from of the of the funds yes yeah. six years from now what do you think? What do you think the next six years will have in store? The next five years within the innovation space within Arc. Yeah. What do you uh, see? Well, uh, a lot of people when we started Arc uh, thought we were a niche strategy, and that was fine. I liked that. You know, competition was going to stay away from niche. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't going to move the needle at the big houses, and uh, so. And now they are starting to develop research uh, in the innovation space as well, which which we're really happy about because we think uh, the most massive misallocation of capital in the history of the world took place in uh, these later days of indexation. Now that uh, more than half of stocks are in indexed-based strategies, um, we believe the pendulum has pretty much swung as far as it it is going to. I say that, you know, famous last words, who knows, but uh, it seems as though that is true. And that this search for, okay, how is the world going to look instead of, you know, how is this index positioned and shall we take 50 basis points uh, more of uh, that stock or 50 basis points less? We're getting some real research now moving into the innovation space. Uh, and this niche strategy what once people considered a niche strategy is the way the world is going to work. These are the next, if we're going to continue with indexes, and I'm sure we will, um, uh, these are the next big uh, index stocks or benchmark stocks. Uh, and we think that we are in the early days of scaling each of our five platforms in the early, genomics is the earliest to be sure, maybe blockchain, blockchain and, and uh, genomics. Uh, and the others, as I mentioned, retail is only now in the United States begun to enter that sweet spot of the S-curve. So I think that the next five years is going to be, you know, scaling these exponential growth trajectories and um, and learning that this wasn't a niche strategy. This was a, a strategy that understood that five major innovation platforms evolving at the same time again, involving 14 technologies, we're going to transform the world completely. And, uh, you know, you have to be on the right side of change. Uh, so I believe we're going to scale exponentially during the next five years. And a lot of people ask us about capacity. If we're right, if our research is correct, then we should be able to scale exponentially as well. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to, to, to trying to, to forecast the next five years and the five years after that along the way. Um, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Fred, as always. All right. All right, cheers. <laughs> and that concludes Biz 2020, Volume 3. Thank you again to Ryan Wyatt, Adam Bry, Tasha Keeney, and of course, Kathy Wood for providing all of your time and expertise today. And thank you to all who joined us. As a reminder, a recording of this video will be made available on ARC's YouTube channel. If you want more innovation insights, please check out our podcast, FYI, the For Your Innovation podcast. Thanks again, and please stay safe, healthy, and innovative. Have a great rest of your day.